this is the place where I found Jesus. This is the place where I have grown in God. This is the place where I found another family, the family of Christ here at Bethel. This is the place where I have discovered new realms of God's word and his spirit. This is the place that's changed me forever. And this is the place for you as well, where you have experienced God and he's done great things in you and through you. I hope you guys don't mind, but you're kind of stuck with me today. Is that okay? Sorry. We've been on a a series for the past few weeks. This is the place. And throughout this series, we've heard some great things, great testimonies from you guys. This is the place where God did awesome things in my life. This is the place where I was saved. You know, you've heard Pastor Jared's testimony. This is the place where he found Christ. We've seen so many of those things. And the fact of the matter is, the more we see these testimonies, the more we realize that God is restoring lives. God is mending marriages. God is putting lives back together. And it's an amazing thing to see that people here, people that I'm looking at right now, I'm looking across the room and and I see some of you guys where God has done incredible things in your life. And that's amazing. It's an awesome time. This is the place. And out of all that, out of all the testimonies that we hear, the one thing that stands, I guess, firm with everybody, it's kind of across the table is, I love this place. It's one of the things you hear, we see, you write down, we, we hear, we get emails, we see these things saying, I love this place, I love Bethel, I love Bethel. And that's one thing that's kind of a common theme among everybody. So I kind of want to continue on that for a minute. I've been here, me and my wife and family have been here for about a year and a half now. And I have to say, and I think I can speak for my wife as well, but from the minute we walked in to Bethel, we felt loved, we felt welcomed, we felt believed in, we felt like you guys actually thought we could do something good. Um, and we felt that, and we felt just the love and the, the you know, just the prayers that you guys have had for us, for my family, and and this is the place where we call home. This is the place where we've grown. I've seen my wife, I've seen my daughter, myself. We've grown in intimacy with God. I think more than we have in years of ministry. And it's been an amazing thing. So today I want to look at that. This is the place to grow in intimacy with God. Now, intimacy is something that every person in this room, every one of you, long for. Believe it or not. If you're married, you long for intimacy with your spouse. That's that's not natural. It's God-given. This is no different with God. He longs for intimacy with us. There's a book by a guy, I think Gene Edwards wrote it, but it's called The Divine Romance. And in this book, you see the beginning, you see creation. Some of you have heard me tell this before if you've been to a Wednesday night class that I did, but he creates Adam. And when Adam's asleep, he takes the rib. You know, we all know the story and creates Eve. Well, Adam wakes up, or Eve wakes up before Adam in this book. I'm not, this is, it's fiction, okay? But it's got a good, cool story. Eve wakes up and wanders off. She's walking around and and all that. And Adam wakes up. And Adam's looking around and he knows something's wrong. He knows there's somebody else there. He can feel it. Maybe it's in his side. uh, But he can feel it. it. It's butterflies or either it's surgery. One of the two he feels. But so he's he's walking around and he's looking for this other person, this counterpart. And he's walking around and he's screaming for her. He's walking through the garden. He's screaming for her. And finally when they meet, and the way he writes it in the book is when they see each other, they run towards each other. And it's almost like we all right now probably went to that, you know, the, what is it, chariots of fire playing when somebody's pranced. But, you know, 
in the book, he writes that. He talks about how they run to each other, and when they get to each other, it's like this embrace of intimacy there that they share. When they fail in the garden and they sinned, the Bible says the first thing they did was they hid. They hid from God. And God, all-knowing, all-powerful, keep in mind, starts screaming for Adam. Where are you? God knew where he was. Come on. But he's going, where are you? Why did he do that? This is what I believe. I believe because he wanted God to step out and experience intimacy with him like a creation that has fallen. If you think about yourself, God pursues us on a daily basis. He does. But we have to take that step towards him as well to experience intimacy. You'll never experience intimacy with your spouse if you don't spend time with them. It won't happen. So we want to talk about intimacy today. A man named Henry Nowen once wrote, Intimacy is not a happy medium. It is a way of being in which the tension between distance and closeness is dissolved and a new horizon appears. Intimacy is beyond fear. Intimacy is closing the distance. That's intimacy. It's closing the distance. Today I want to show you a few ways in which we can know that God himself desires an intimate, love-based relationship with us. Number one, he's knocking at our door. Now, Revelation 3.20 says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. In this scripture, we see Jesus standing outside the door of his own church. It got weird because we've heard this, and I've heard it in the past. I'm not going to get on that soapbox, but I've heard it in the past where preachers will give this salvation message, and they'll say, Jesus is standing at the door, and he's knocking. Just let him in. This is not the context of the scripture. Jesus is standing at the church's door, knocking. Let me in. Where are you? I just want intimacy. I just want to know you. Let me in. And he's banging on the door. Let me in. There's an indication of the desired intimacy that Christ has for his people, that he has for his church. It's our job, our job to open the door. It's our job to pursue the one who's knocking. Sometimes, let's be honest, we get lazy. It's part of it. We get withdrawn due to the craziness of life or either a lack of faith. Maybe you've got things going on in your life and you just your faith is shot a little bit. If you notice, Jesus isn't going to force his way in. The Bible says he stood at the door and knocked. It doesn't say he took a sledgehammer and knocked the door down. It said he stood there and knocked. Why is that? Because he's waiting for our response. That's all he's doing. He's waiting for us to respond to him. Worship is a prime example. Worship is one of the greatest ways to experience intimacy with God. It's one of my favorite things. I love worship. We're, I think we're a worship family because we just we love it. Every one of us in, in my family, me and my wife and even my daughter, is, we just love worship. It's just one of those things where you just feel free. You know, you just feel like you can just get in the presence of God. Nobody's going to bother you. In our worship, let me ask you this question. Do we pursue God or do we sit back and wait for him to pursue us? What does your worship look like? If you have the opportunity and you never pursue intimacy, you will never experience it. You're not going to experience it unless you pursue it. This scripture was written for the, tur- for the church, as I mentioned. It's the church of Laodicea who had grown lazy. They were no longer seeking intimacy with the Father. They had grown lukewarm and were no longer pursuing God. 
is what this scripture is based on. They were in a stage of mere existence rather than pursuit. So they were just existing. I don't know about you, but I don't want Bethel to be a church that just exists. We need to be a church in pursuit. In the last days, which I believe we're living in, you watch the news for a minute and you'll believe that too, but I believe we are in the last days. But I also believe in the last days it's not a time for the church to sit back and go, well, I'm already saved, so we're good. I think it's a ch- time for the church to pursue that intimacy. To go- I mean, I want to walk into heaven on a cloud, just, just fly in because I've pursued him so much, I'm exhausted spiritually. Come on, church. If you desire intimacy with God, move. Move. Move towards the door and open it. Number two, second thing I want you to see is that he calls us his friends. John 15, 15 says, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. I want you to see something very important. We do not follow Christ simply because of some chance impulse. We have been specifically chosen and called to be his friend. Let's let's think about that for a minute. Look at the very next verse, John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that you... Your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the Father in my name, I may give it to you. He may give it to you. We have been specifically appointed, ordained, and placed in this unique relationship that we may produce the right things in life. It's an opportunity. We obviously serve Christ as Christ's followers. But in this scripture... We're promised to be friends. We throw around the, the slogan, I'm a slave for Christ a lot. Which, you know, technically, we are. We, we do what he says. But here's the difference. A slave is someone who is made to do something. God doesn't make us serve him. He just desires us to. He just desires that relationship. And that's why he can bump it up to a friend. Because let me tell you who's a slave. Satan's a slave. He's a slave to sin. He's a slave to righteousness of God. He's a slave to the lordship of Jesus. When Jesus rose from the dead and he put his foot on Satan's neck to walk out of the tomb, I'm going to tell you, that made him a slave. You don't do that to your friends. We who seek intimacy with our creator, who long for his presence, who desire to serve him because we love him, have been elevated to friendship with the most high God. That, to me, is knowing people in high places. Third thing I want you to look at. He calls us his children. 1 John 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. I'm going to take a, a couple of minutes on this because I want, you to, I want you to listen carefully. I want to try to be sensitive because the idea of this can be heavy, can be a heavy topic to some people. There are those out there and possibly in here today may not know your parents, may have been adopted or may have never met them before. There are those who have been tossed aside as worthless orphans. There are those who have been deeply wounded by their parents, no matter what it is, no matter if they have experienced a, a, a nasty divorce or they've watched their parents go through things or their parents have kind of pushed them to the side for, for a career or whatever it is. We read, we read constantly of children who are left alone. We read of children who are abused and take advantage of. News stories are full of these things. 
But when you think about being a child of God, orphan is not in the conversation. Are you listening? Child of God, listen to this, is not forsaken, forgotten about, abused, neglected, given up on, thrown away, or abandoned. So if you've experienced that today, if you've experienced that in your life, look at your heavenly father and say, I'm not abandoned. I'm not abused. I'm not thrown away. I'm not despised. I'm not pushed aside for something else. I know my God, my father in heaven pursues me. A child of God is loved cared for, desired, thought about constantly, protected, accepted, forgiven, and thought of as royalty. Wow. Being a child of God helps us to understand intimacy. When you see yourself as a child of God, it creates within you a deeper desire for intimacy with your heavenly Father. That desire inside of you is placed there by God. He's put it there. Because for the simple reason, he wants to have a relationship with you. Number four, he calls us his bride. Revelation 21.9 refers to us as the bride of Christ. Ephesians 5.22 uses the marriage relationship to describe the kind of relationship that Christ has with his church. Okay, so we see in Scripture where this is kind of a normal thing, this mentioning of us being a bride of Christ. Now, a few months ago, my lovely wife went out of town. I couldn't go. It was not fun. All right, I remember I was miserable. I, was mis- I would text her all the time, texting, texting, texting. What are you doing? I'm busy. What are you doing? I'm busy because she was going to my sister-in-law's wedding. And so she's like, I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm busy. I can't talk. I can't talk. I'm like, you need to talk to me because I'm bored. I'm lonely. I just want you to be here, not there. I was lonely. I was bored. I was ready for her to be back home. I think about God. I think about how he must feel when we, his bride, leave him. Now, it may not be on purpose, but when we fail to pursue intimacy with him, we abandon his presence in our life. Do you understand that? If we don't pursue intimacy with our creator, we abandon his presence. We kind of say, no, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. And it creates a distance. Our goal here at Bethel is to help you attain that intimacy that your spirit so deeply longs for. That's what our goal is. You've heard me say a lot, God, I just want to see the supernatural. I don't want to play church. We don't want to play church at Bethel. We want to see God move. I want to see the power of the Holy Spirit come through this place. I want to see people get baptized with the power of the Holy Spirit right here. I want to see people be healed. I want to see people get set free. On Sunday morning, while you're here, We want to help bring you into an intimate relationship with God. Intimacy is more than just attending church. It's a way of life. In order to understand how to attain something, we first have to understand what that something is. Right? If I said, do you have a stick, and you don't know what a stick is, but you could be holding a stick in your hand, you wouldn't know if you had a stick or not. Make sense? The word intimacy carries with it the aspects of a relationship with someone where you are, I love this, where you are vulnerable. You are loving, you are trusting, etc., etc. 
To have an intimate relationship with God means that the deepest part of you is having a relationship with a deep part of God. I'm going to try to wake you up real quick. When worship is going on, and you see yourself lifting your hands, and maybe your foot's bouncing a little bit. Some of you, that's a lot. you you got to start thinking, okay, I'm in a place of vulnerability because people around me may see me. But see, to be intimate with God, you have to be vulnerable. You have to say, God, whatever it takes, whatever i got to do, if I've got a chicken dance around this sanctuary, I'll do it. I just need some intimacy with you. I just need to know you a little more. It's part of it. I've told students in the past, I said, I want everybody in here to lift your hands. They were sitting down just like, lift your hands, lift your hands. So I want to try this drill with you. I want everybody in here to lift your hands. Come on. just. <laughs> okay. Now look around. We all look stupid. It doesn't matter. It's being vulnerable before God and allowing the Holy Spirit to rock you. That's intimacy. You can't fathom the deepest part of God. It's impossible. But in the case of intimacy, he's willing to come to our level and reveal part of himself that only the believer through the cross of Christ can enjoy and experience. Intimacy will not be hindered by sin. Our intimacy with God first began in the Garden of Eden when God walked with man in Genesis chapter 2. It was something God desired. I love reading that story of how God walked with Adam in the cool of the day. They walked together. They talked together. They were friends. They, they were so close. We all know the story. Adam's sin and intimacy with God was lost. But God had a plan. He offered a way through Christ that we could retain that intimacy that he first created for us. Fellowship with mankind was restored through the blood of Christ. It was restored. We messed it up. He fixed it. Intimacy with God is a privilege given freely to us by Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. He removed our sin so that we might dwell with God. If you're living in sin or have sin in your life, that sin will hinder your intimacy with God. It'll put a wedge there. I know people that have beaten themselves up because they can't seem to get close to God. They want to, but after talking to them, you realize there's so much hidden sin there that they've created a abyss between them and God and they're reaching it they're reaching it problem is that sin is a hindrance to them now am I saying that you got to be without sin to experience intimacy with God no we all mess up we're humans but there's a difference between living in the sin that you have and expecting God to take you out of that sin Does that make sense? Let me see if I can rephrase that a little bit. There's a difference between living in the sin and liking it than having the sin in your life and trying to get rid of it. Intimacy with God begins when we radically pursue him with our whole heart. David wrote in Psalm 27, 8, When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, O Lord, I shall seek. God invites us in James 4, 8, draw near to him and he will draw near to us. One of the most amazing books I think I've ever read in my life, and I'm going to give you guys a little reference here. This is free. Um, John Bevere, Drawing Near. It is one of the most incredible books I've ever read in my life. It'll mess you up. So that's just a commercial break there. Sometimes we get this idea that if God wants to have intimate relationship with us, he will come after us. 
Now, listen, we got to get this straight here. It's true that God has pursued us, but we also have to pursue him. If we wait for God to come, with, come to us without us moving towards him, we will become frustrated and never experience his presence. Why do you think it's at times, and maybe it's not you, maybe you're holy, but maybe it's times when you see someone getting moved on by God and you're standing here like this and you get all jealous about it. Maybe that person's pursuing him and you're not. Maybe that person's pursuing him and you're waiting for him to pursue you. Then you have a problem. You won't experience intimacy. I'm going to give you divine revelation right now. So everybody listen. God will never draw near to those who do not draw near to him. And the way we draw near is through righteousness. God's pursuit of us takes place at all times. But true intimacy is found when we pursue him as well. Recently, Charisma Magazine put out an article, and this was the title of it, Finding Intimacy with God. In that article, it disturbed me, but this is what was written. It is to our shame that in our era, Church services do not focus more on actually seeking God. Yes, we do honor God and thank him for what he has done. We hear a sermon and perhaps enjoy a time of fellowship with others, yet only rarely do we depart a congregational meeting with the fire of eternity reflecting off our faces. Instead, we fill up with information about God without actually drawing near to him. Most of us are largely unaware of God's presence. Why do you think we sing a song that says, make us aware of your presence? Because sometimes we get so caught up in life, or we get caught up on what's going on, or we get caught up in uh, beating the other churches to the best restaurant in town after church, so we're looking at our clock all the time. Stop it. Move towards the door and open it. Let's be the church. The church is no holds barred. The church is not worried about whether I'm going to offend this person or offend this person or offend this person. What we do is, what the church does, the church that God created, that his desire for the church is, is to say, God, move any way you want to. I'm not going to hinder you at all. If we're living in the last days truly, we should have an urgency within us for intimacy. Let me tell you a byproduct of intimacy. When you find intimacy with God, a byproduct of that, which means something that happens because of that, people get saved. People come to Christ. I've said this before, but here's what the church was created for. The church was created so that you as a body of believers find intimacy and you go outside the walls and you win people. That's the church. Our church leadership here, I promise you, um, has a desire to see every one of you, every one of us, we want it for us, to experience intimacy with God. We want to see that happen so badly. I know there's been countless conversations me and Pastor Jared's had about that. Just, Just want to see the supernatural. Our desire is for all to understand that he's knocking on our door with a desire to know us in a deeper way. He calls us his friends and has a desire to share things on a regular basis. We are his children. He longs to spend time with. We are his bride in which he takes great delight. One day, I'm going to give you another divine revelation. Are you ready for it? We're all going to die. That's sad. But one day, we're all going to meet Jesus face to face. We're all going to stand before God one day. And you know what? There's nothing we can do about it, so let's just accept it today and move on. No matter what we've been through, we know that intimacy 
that we desire will last for eternity. Revelation 24. On that day, God will wipe away every tear. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Life is hard. I understand that. Life is hard. Things come at us from all different directions, but even in all that chaos that could possibly take place, there's peace when you have intimacy. There is a peace there. Now, does that stop things from taking place? No. That's like telling a homeless person, if you accept Christ, you'll have a house tomorrow. I can't say that because I don't know what God has planned. But I, know, I do know this. When you accept Christ, there is an eternal peace that comes on you. There is that understanding that someone bigger than anybody in your life loves you unconditionally and just wants to spend time with you. Pain, death, sorrow. I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer here, but they're all part of life. So my question to you is, if all this is part of life anyway, why shouldn't intimacy with a God be? Why shouldn't that be something that we pursue? See, that's something that brings us joy and peace and comfort. But we sometimes we don't pursue that because we're so focused on the things that bring us depression. So what will you do? What will you do today? What's your, what's your thoughts? Bow your heads with me this morning. You know, I, I firmly believe that God stands here and he just weeps for some of you because he just wants to spend time with you. He just wants to know you. And you know what? Every once in a while, he just wants to just give you a hug for no reason. A few years ago, I knew a guy that Whenever you talked about God, every single thing you talked about was a debate because he was just trying to put so much thought into it, trying to make everything intelligence, a matter of intelligence. Sometimes we just need to not only be vulnerable, but just be stupid and say, God, I don't know. I don't know. I just need you. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to say right now. I just need you. I just need one of those hugs. I just need you love me. Some of you are maybe going through an issue. Maybe what we talked about, about children and God calling us his children. Maybe that hurts when you hear that because you say, you know what? My parents didn't love me. Maybe I'm adopted and you say, why didn't my parents love me? I'm here to tell you that there's a Father in heaven who will never leave you nor forsake you and loves you more than creation. The Bible tells us that not even a bird will fall to its death apart from the Father's will. That tells me that something so simple, something so small, God still looks at it. The Bible also tells us that the eyes of the Lord go back and forth throughout the earth. And some translation says, looking for the true worshiper. Looking for the one who will pursue intimacy. Looking for the one that just wants a relationship with him.
Maybe you know what it's like to be lonely. You say, I know what it's like to not have anybody around, to just be lonely. Now I want you to flip that around and say, does God know what it li- is like to be lonely because I'm not pursuing him? This is what I'm going to ask. If you're in here today and you say, I don't have a relationship with God. Jesus is not my Savior. You know, that sounds brutal. It sounds rough because, you know, we all like to think that. But dig deep inside. You know. And you say, I need prayer. Will you pray with me? Because I I know I can never experience intimacy because I don't even know him. And maybe today he's looking at you going, I just want to meet you. If you say that, and you say, today I want to make a commitment to Christ, and I want to give my life to him, you're not joining a church. You're not doing all that kind of stuff. It's not about that. It's about intimacy with a father who loves you. If you can say that today, will you just lift your hand so I can see it, so I can pray for you? It's just a step of faith saying, you know what? Here I am. Pray for me. You can buy it all. Here's the second thing. Maybe you say, I'm one of those who stand there and wait for God to pursue me. Maybe you're one of those who say, if God wants me to move, he'll move me. Or maybe you say, I've been saved for 80 years. I'm right where I need to be. But, one of the most powerful words in the English language is but. But. Because but's an excuse. But you say, today, I want to begin my journey of pursuing him. It's about him. Everything we do here is about him. If you say, pray for me, I need to learn how to pursue intimacy with my father. And I haven't done that. Will you just lift your hand so I can pray for you? Thank you. Thank you. All over the place. I'm going to ask one more thing. You can put your hands down. Maybe you're here today and you're hurting. Maybe physical or, you know what, it may be emotional. And today you just need a daddy. You just need a father in heaven that's going to love you. It's going to maybe wrap his arms around you and just hold you for a minute. You say, pray for me. That's me. Will you lift your hand so I can see you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask everybody if you'll stand to your feet this morning. If you... I need some leaders up here. If you lifted your hand this morning and you feel comfortable, we really, we just want to pray for you. We 
would you step out from where you're at and just make your way up here and find one of our leaders here to just pray for you? We just want to pray for you. That's it. Nothing weird. We just want to pray for you and agree with you that God's going to do whatever you need him to do. So if you will, step out from where you're at. Come up here. Let's get prayer. Let's pray for each other. We're family. It's family of God. Here together. If I can get some more leaders up here, please. Church, would you just stretch your hand out and let's begin to pray for these. Lord, help us to pursue you. God, help us experience intimacy. Lord, I pray for every individual here that lifted their hand. Lord, that needs prayer, even for those that may may not have responded. But God, they need you. Lord, even right where they're at, I pray, Father, for you to touch them. Touch them in a mighty way. God, those here that that need intimacy, that need to experience it, who begin to move in their heart, begin to stir them. Lord, begin to put a, or to strengthen, is a better word, strengthen their desire for you. Help us understand how to pursue you. Lord, for those here that are are hurting, maybe it's physical, maybe it's emotional, I pray right now, God, and I ask you right now, wherever they are, wherever they are across this room, whether they're at the front or whether they're in their seats, Lord, I pray right now that you will just hold them. God, that you'll just wrap your arms around them and just love on them for a minute. God, let them know you're here. Let them know you love them. Let them know you care for them. God, I ask for a breakthrough. pray, God, if there's people in here today that need physical healing, Lord, I pray right now for physical healing to take place, Lord. God, for ailments to be healed. God, for bodies to be restored. God, for pain to go away. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for meeting us where we are. Lord, we give you glory, honor, and praise. God, I ask that you will bless every person in this room. Lord, I speak life over every person in this room, Lord. Pray, God, that your presence will be known in their life. God, even when they're at home, may your presence, may the anointing of the Spirit of God fill their house and fill their life, Lord. Help us to understand how to walk in your presence daily. Walk in your presence. You're worthy today. We give you glory. 
and praise. Thank you for what you've done here. Thank you for moving in lives. Thank you for touching hearts. Thank you for healing that's going to take place. Thank you for healing that's already taking place. You mend the broken hearts. You set the captives free. We love you in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen. Thank you guys for coming. It's a great day so far. We got one more service. So you know what? If you're leaving, if you're going home, if you're going to an early lunch, you know what? Pray for the next service that God is going to do something. Also, Sunday school starts at 10 o'clock. We have a lot of classes to choose from, so we hope to see you there.